Welcome back to Reality Asserts Itself on The Real News Network. I'm Paul Jay. We're continuing our series of discussions with Sabah El Nasiri, and he joins me again in the studio. Thanks for joining us. Pleasure. So one more time, Sabah was born in Basra, Iraq. He teaches at the Political Science Department at York University in Toronto. And his most recent publication is Arab Revolutions and Beyond, the Middle East and Reverberations in the Americas. Mm. So the book's mostly about the Arab Spring. Right. And you've paid a particular attention to the Arab Spring in Egypt. Mm. Uh, so, so where are things at? Uh, you know, like, I guess what happened, uh, you know, there was kind of a euphoria for a right. while, the right. downfall of Mubarak, and now even Mubarak's out of jail. Right. And, <coughs> and his sons, being, yeah. Uh, resuscitated. <coughs> Uh, both uh, literally and uh, metaphorically. Right. Uh, but uh, w what happened and where are things at? Right. I mean, the idea of the book was to link the Arab Revolution to global protest in Europe and the Americas and so on. Because it, not, it was not a coincidence that you have multiple revolts in different parts of the world because of the crisis failing of the neoliberal projects. It was, you know, uh, I wouldn't say it was because I think revolutions are processes. They are not just event or act that happens physically or institutionally, but a long process, which implies, and that was something I was anticipating at that time when I was writing uh, a chapter on Egypt, for instance, that you will have counter-revolutionary tendencies, violent tendencies, pushback from the military, intervention from outside, you know, imperialist power, to push back against the will and the demand of the people. And, and there was yeah. a quite a profound effect. I remember at the yeah. time, uh, there were movements, whether it was amongst uh, African Americans, right. and black Canadians, right. and native people, right. and, uh, and, you know, occupy the, right. this idea where yeah. if people can do it in a place like Egypt, then yes. we can do it here. Every, we can do it everywhere. That's true. They can see it also in Greece, in Spain, in Portugal, in Mexico, in Chile, etc. So it has an enormous global uh, effect. And a lot of protest movement in the world were cross-referencing and referencing the Arab revolutions and their slogans and their and their struggle for justice, equality, etc. So again, you know, this is the, the the start of the revolution, and it was pretty much successful uh, without planning, without a coherent organization. It was much more spontaneous. You know, uh, all possible classes and groups within the society were represented, and that was the strength of it, but also the weakness of it. Because without a strategic, programmatic, coherent organization and leadership, then the pushback against these movements, the political, the military, etc., you know, would be facilitated by the state apparatus because you have still the old guards within these institutions. They are not gone just because Mubarak was gone or Bin Ali was gone or Ali Abdullah Saleh and Yemen was gone, right? So there are still these interests and forces that will push back. And it made it easy for them to push back against the, um, you know, the, the spontaneous movement precisely for the lack of organization and leadership and so on. So what happens is there was at the beginning some sort of transition, democratic transition, where the Muslim Brotherhood won the election democratically. I mean, they had a lot of you know social bases and so on within Egypt. I think what, where the activists did a mistake that enabled the the army in Egypt and especially Sisi to dominate the political scene again was when these protests uh, escalated in May, June, two thousand. Um, 2014 against the Muslim Brotherhood. 2014 against the Muslim Brotherhood. That you know it enabled the the military to enter the scene and say we are siding with the people against the Muslim Brotherhood for the Islamization of the state for this and that. So actually, some of the activists, of course not all, but some of the activists of the revolution were to blame that Sisi came back again. To, to power, the military came back again, now di directly controlling state institution beyond the military apparatus, beyond the economy which they control. Now they control the parliament, they control the, the executive, and the president is you know, a general from the army. So you have a much more repressive regime compared to Mubarak or Sadat or whatever before it. And it becomes now much more difficult for, uh, you know, for, for activists in Egypt even to criticize Sisi, or to organize and protest, and now the the military 
and especially through CC, they are pushing for these constitutional changes to give the president even more power uh, and restrict more the ability of people to protest and, and so on. Of course, they use or abuse this artifact, terrorism, in the name of terrorism and security, we, you know, we silence people, we oppress people, etc. Something you can see it all, all over the place, even in the United States or you know, in other liberal democracies, right? But there, in a much more physical, violent way uh, uh, compared to the situation, the pre-revolutionary situation. Yet I think this is only one moment, and, it, it, and it's clearly a moment of crisis, of legitimacy, and of the authority of the state in Egypt. Because if you rely heavily on violence, on repression, on the restriction of freedoms and so on, that means you are in a deep crisis. You cannot appeal to the people. You cannot you know, uh, rely on some sort of legitimacy among the population. So that means the, the revolutionary story is not over yet. We are witnessing one you know, counter-revolutionary setbacks against the revolution, but I'm confident that Revolts and, 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 and revolution will, will erupt again and again, and be it, you know, uh, some simple demands of the people. You can think about Lebanon and Iraq, you know, this um, anti garbage demonstration that mobilized 100,000 people because of the garbage. You know, it is, at the face of it, it's non political issue, but de facto mobilized 100,000 people, and those people who joined this movement, you know, realize you cannot get rid of the garbage if you, go on, if, if you can't get rid of the garbage system. They, they realize the, the, you know, the depth of the corruption within the system. So they, they gain this consciousness that even asking for simple demand, trying to change simple thing, will not happen as long as there is no radical changing within the state and the institution. And I think this will give people you know, more and, you know, determination to get organized and protest and, 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 and again articulate the demand of the people of the Arab Revolution in 2010 and 11. It seemed to me one thing in common with, with the various countries that experienced these popular right. uprisings, right. you know, whether it's Le uh, Libya, mm -hmm. Syria, Syria, Yemen, uh, Egypt, of course. Mm. That there wasn't a leadership there yeah, that could either, of, right. in, in the Egyptian case, mm. wasn't able, and maybe there wasn't time and capability, of course, but the, not to have a second act, not to have an electoral strategy. Right. You know, that the mass protest right. on its own, right. it, it needed the next step, and the next step was to be able to fight in the elections. Right. And there, there was no leadership there to right. create that. Right. In the other countries, uh, th there was uh, there was no leadership to avoid them being taken over by external forces and manipulated, right. and become you know eight, you know proxy wars. Right, right. Uh, right. Is that situation changing? Like for example, in Egypt, uh, yeah. it's very difficult conditions right. to organize anything there now. Yeah, right. But do you have, see the be is is there is there the beginnings of a kind of leadership, a party, something right. that would give this kind of mass movement more direction? Yeah. I mean, we have to look at it case by case. Um, if you look at Tunisia, you can say there was relatively success uh, in pushing back against Al Nahda, a Muslim Brotherhood like political force, which won the election at the beginning in Tunisia. But then these Nida Tunis, you know, a platform of liberal, left liberal movement and so on, were able to win the, the, the parliament uh, and the presidency. So there was a pushback against this religious movement. But to their credit, Al Nahda. Um, you know, followed this peaceful scenario. They did not uh, want to escalate the conflict with the lefties or liberal or with the army, like in Egypt, the Muslim Brotherhood did. So they went the other way. And that's why, that explained why it was relatively successful in, T in Tunisia, but not in Egypt. The Libyan scenario was, was different because the Libyan scenario, to my mind and to my understanding, was the mean through which, especially the Gulf monarchy, with the support of France, UK, and the United States to push back against the Arab Revolution by militarizing it. And Libya gave them the option, especially Gaddafi, right, to militarize the conflict there or the protest of the people. And once you, once you start a war and uh, pursue a regime change, and then you can, own, you can also push back, in the case of the Gulf monarchy in Bahrain, Saudi Arabia, against the protest of your own people. And, uh, you know, the security, you know, war against Sarah, blah, blah, blah. So they, they abused, in a way, the protests of the, of the Libyan people for their own 
you know, um, uh, purposes with the support, of course, with NATO. And for the first time you have a NATO, especially France and the UK, were saying, you know, we are, we are intervening in Libya, not because uh, for whatever reason, oil and so on, it is the Arabic country that asked us to, you know, to, to, to intervene. But de facto, if you look at the voting within the, the, the Arab League, you will see, you know, nine of the 21 countries that voted for yes were the, the Gulf monarchies and the other two monarchies, Jordan and Morocco. The other, they were either not present or were against it. So you can see there's a clear project here of the Gulf monarchies with the support of the US, UK, and France to push back against the Arab Revolution by militarizing the conflict. Then you have, you know, the, the second scenario in Syria. Again, the, the conflict was militarized pretty soon uh, and became a proxy war. And that was the, you know, the most effective modus operandi through which Saudi Arabia, Gulf monarchies, the United States and UK can push back against the Arab Revolution and ensure that no popular figure or movement can, you know, um, win election or, or so on. In the course of these <clears throat> things, they destroy these societies. Absolutely, destroy the societies. You know, 100,000 people are killed, million of people are displaced, etc. But still, I think, despite all this violence and displacement and so on, all these regimes are in crisis. And, and, the, and the, you know, the, the imperialist power that support them, like France or UK and US, they are all themselves in crisis. So that's why I, and I never, you know, Gave my give up my hope that uh, not only my hope, but I think if I am correct that you know this crisis situation, the current regimes and governments will won't be able to you know to satisfy the demands of the people. We have the same demands, the same social situation, the same poverty, injustice, and so on that you know uh, produced this Arab revolution in the first place. Nothing has changed. So that means I would expect in the in the near future, not in the long term. Uh, a lot of people will get organized and revolt and protest. And that's something that could also undermine the U.S. project in, in the region. Not so much, you know. But, but, they, but, but there's still this issue that the revolt, the protest, the people in the yes, streets, yeah. there needs to be a second act and there right. needs to be some kind of a leadership that gets to right. that second True. act. Like at that moment True. after around the uh, election of the Muslim Brotherhood, yeah. Uh, you know, we were in real news. We were doing story after story right. about don't forget who the military is. Right. The army cannot be True. the solution True. here. And look True. at the history of, of Egypt. Yes. Yes. Uh, but so many of the young people, uh, yeah. you know, seem to get sucked into this thing. Right. Somehow the army is going to be the one to defend democracy, yeah. which means there's a lack of political force there to, you know, educate the young people. In yeah. Yeah. I mean, it depends. Uh, well, whom you speak to and where you are, because a lot of I think a lot of activists in Egypt, especially on the socialist leftist side of it, the pan-Arab side of it, um, they were very you know clear and aware of of the of the army, and they knew that just a tactic of the army to be, you know to to and ideologically propagate it is with the with the people because it is opportune to do this in this scenario. Right? to get rid of Mubarak, and, but then take over. So they were aware of that. And if you look at the election, for instance, that's really interesting. If you compare Morsi to Sabahin, the Nasserists, the Pan-Arabists, you know, he got 19.5% uh, and, and Morsi was 20.5. There's one to 1.5 percentage difference between them, right? It's the army that supported Morsi to become the president against Sabahin. So even then, it was not really clear for the army that they can, you know, push through with this. So imagine if Sabahin would have won the election, things probably would have been different, right? So again, sometimes small things can, you know, decide the, you know, development for years and decades to come, right? So but you're right, still the question of organization and leadership, what type of organization, uh, what type of leadership, like one, one of my critique, again, in, in, in the book, and especially in the chapter on Egypt, to say that despite the, uh, the militancy of the Egyptian working class, and the strike, the, the, you know, the protest, and the, they organized, etc., etc., I think one of the mistakes was after, you know, March, February, March 2011, when Mubarak, you know, was toppled, that the Egyptian working class did not form a worker party. 
Think about Brazil in 1984 with the PT, the Worker Party in Brazil, right? When the workers start organizing their own party that represent them, not rely on these liberal whatever bourgeois parties. And they were much pretty successful in 1999, Lula became the president, right? So a mistake not to, to, to form a, a party that is class-based on the working class and peasant demands, right? That would have been a powerful force that could have helped, you know, in election and post-election scenarios. And that, we had a know. team in, in Egypt reporting yeah. that. Yeah. And they were doing interviews with workers yeah. Sophisticated conversations against privatization, right? And, and it, it wasn't, you know, these are workers that were capable Absolutely. of supporting a Absolutely. party like that. Absolutely, but the problem is, was the priority was to have independent or autonomous trade unions, because the trade unions were mostly, you know, affiliated with the regime and controlled by the regime. So most of the, you know, workers. They, they opted for this economic struggle to have some sort of inde inde independency of the trade union, thinking that will secure the interests of the worker in the long run. But that's, I think, the false strategy. I think if you, on, let's say, on, 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 on the national scene, not only in a specific sector of the economy, if you want to win the, you know, the heart and minds of the people, if you want to be a, hegemonically uh, uh, as a political force that represent the Egyptian people, you need to have a worker party. You need to form a worker party that represent not only, of course, the interests of worker, but in a, in, in a progressive sense, in a, you know, is to represent all the interests of the popular classes, the middle class, the, the peasant, etc. That would have been And the do you right. get a sense that it's happening now? Well, the problem is there's so much repression and 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 a narrowing of the space of maneuver of, of, of workers and peasants and activists in Egypt that it seems almost impossible now to pursue such project but it seems but I don't think it's impossible I think at one specific moment all these different activists and so on section of different classes would re realize without building a coherent a, you know, organization, a party, and so on, you can't face the military. You can't face the, the, the you know, the, the different state institution, be it the legal system or whatever. You need to have a unified force. And I cannot imagine uh, any other unified force at, at this juncture without a new type of political party. A political party that is not, you know, authoritarian, hierarchical, and so on, but much more, you know, horizontally, network-like, democratic uh, structure of um, uh, organization that represent the, the demands of the popular classes. Only then you will have a serious force that the military and the bureaucrats and the state apparatus really or seriously fear. Well, the book is Arab Revolutions and Beyond. Beyond yes. And I guess that story is not over yet. Nope. All right, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks for having me. And thank you for joining us on Reality Asserts Itself on the Real News Network.